Hello viewers, welcome to this program where we talk to the writers and the prominent persons from the state. Today we have with us Dr. Maria Aurora Kuto, who is someone who we have been delaying to interview for a long time and there is a reason for that. Uh, you know, mobility is an issue and Dr. Kuto has been kind enough to take a, have us at her home today where we talk about her life and times in Goa and elsewhere and all over the world. Doctor, to start with, uh, you know, you have seen many different Goas from growing up in Portuguese Goa to going to Darwai, other parts of India, London. How has your life changed along this way and what are the lessons that, you know, the different experiences taught you? Well, yes, I've learnt a lot going through various stages of my life. But I wouldn't presume to teach anyone about it. Uh, the point is, of course, that I have learnt a lot. Uh, basically, I think, in the first place, I should make it clear that I didn't grow up in Goa. I left Goa when I was eight. And so I have lived in a sort of belief in concentric circles which, feature, which uh, are centred on India, Goa and Christianity, which were shared with Alban. So that is how we brought up our children, as Indians, as Goans, as, as Christians, you know. And so I did not change, I evolved. And so in Darwar, when I was eight, I went to a Catholic primary school, junior school, I should say. And then I moved to a Protestant high school. And then I moved to Karnataka College, which had a cross section of students from all over Karnataka, because at that time only Bangalore had colleges. And uh, the great thing about Darwar at that time is that we had, we had loads and loads of Goan students coming there because there were no colleges in Goa and also because we had over se several years two heads, principals of Karnataka College from Goa, Francisco Rafos and Arman Menezes. And when I was studying, Arman Menezes was my, the principal of the college and then the head of the Department of English. And, uh, very much the center of our lives there as students, especially as Goan students. Then there was KJ Mahale, who taught me French. And before that, in my student days, when I was in school, Lucio Rodriguez was there. There was one professor, Vijinkar from Margao, all French professors. So for whatever reason, Darwar was very close to Goa academically. And so we didn't feel cut off from Goa, you know. And my parents, had a faith which was very inclusive and maybe India itself was different at that time. But um, we did not f ever feel that we were different from the rest of the community. And the Darwar Catholic community was minuscule, maybe 2%, 1%. But I was uh, very fortunate with my father, you see, because he uh, was, was, what should I say, strongly grounded in urban, I would call it urban, you know, Margao, Borda, supposedly the elite of uh, intellectual elite. So he was very strong, strongly grounded in that. And some of that sensibility seemed to have flown into me. And uh, he not only used to teach, uh, help make us talk Konkani at home, so some of his best jokes were in Konkani. So I've, many people have asked me, how is it that you grew up in Darwar and you still know your Konkani well, though I can't make a speech in Konkani, I must say. And I speak Portuguese and that's my parents, you know. So they kept Konkani and Portuguese alive. And the Catholic was very, Catholicism was very uh, inclusive. He, I, I translated the ethnography, for instance. How did I, how, how was I able to do that? So the thing is that uh, it was because of the Portuguese my father taught me in Darwar by making me read aloud the Herald and the other Goa papers that used to come. So he used to force me to read aloud. Maybe I cried sometimes, I was quite young. And then he used to write for the newspaper. So he used to dictate to me and uh, there were many spelling mistakes, so I had to keep on doing corrections. So that's how I am what I am, you know. And then we were lucky in the Prince, I was lucky with the having interaction, uh, since I talk about India, Goa, Christianity. I was lucky to have the, what shall I say, the, the in, inclusive um, education sensibility transferred to me by three very important priests in my life. One was Father Philip Suarez, who was a young man from Pune, who came to Darwar at the age of 34 and died there at the age of 84. He never left, but he was passionate about education. 
and he taught us all kinds of things, you know, about film, about classical music, about art, about gardening. You must remember that we were under his influence like I was since the age of nine. And I insisted with my father-in-law that he could collect, have bishops and cardinals or whatever, but my marriage was, had to be celebrated by Philip Suarez. And so they had to give in, and Philip came to uh, the cathedral in Bombay. And so I think the fact that the life of the mind, I like to call it the life of the mind, and I now real, I was told that the life of the mind features li largely in the writings of Thomas Aquinas. I've never read Thomas Aquinas, but my husband used to. But the life of the mind came to me through Father Suarez. And he was inclusive, you know, there was no question of this religion, that religion, don't do this, don't do that. It was life, and life to be lived fully, creatively, happily. Uh, and we were very, what shall I say, we had, a, my parents had a very difficult life economically. So he understood that and he supported us in any, every way he could. And then when, we, when I got married and I went to Patna, uh, I interacted with the, the Patna diocese was under the American Jesuits and so there was Father Donahue who was the vicar general and he took me all around the tribal belt which is now Jharkhand. So the interfaith dialogue happened before my first son was born because we used to go to Mass, to Ranchi, Hazari Bagh and you know in, interact with the lived Christianity in a totally different way. And then when I came to Delhi, the third priest, who was again an intellectual, internationally recognized uh, theologian, Ramundo Panikar, uh, who was a friend of Jose Pereira's as well. And Jose Pereira was a friend of my husband's in college. They were the greatest of friends, as you know. And in college, my husband's passion was uh, comparative religion. And Jose, as you know, did uh, Sanskrit. So that kind of intellectual debate was going on in his life and in my life as I grew up I wouldn't call it an intellectual debate but I certainly would call it an exposure to an open understanding of Indian society, Catholics, what it means to be a Catholic and certainly grounded very much in a sense of uh, Goan identity. I've never ever lost my Goan identity. So I hope that answers your questions but one, one of the things I wanted to say is that um, uh, none of these priests were close to the establishment. In fact, they were never benefited from anything from the establishment. So I'm, that's, I'm not saying that there are no good priests in the establishment. We have got wonderful priests in the establishment, starting with our archbishop. But these priests were... For the few who might not know who Dr. Maria Aurora Kuto is, uh, and even if they know, they won't know your trajectory, could you explain, you know, how you progressed in that sense? from uh, going to Darwad at a very early age. Your, your story of uh, falling in love and getting married with uh, Mr. Alban Kuto is, is very nicely told in Philomena's uh, journeys. So that we will not uh, discuss here. We we'll read it for the leader to discover. But could you explain you know, where all you reached? Because I was trying to, to write something about Mr. Kuto and I got it wrong. So I don't want to repeat that also. No, I think, I think uh, that's a good question because what is central to what I am in many ways and, the, and the very central to the writing of the book, uh, I mean the Goa Daughter story in particular, is, has a lot to do with my husband's career because we were in Patna, we got married in 61 uh, June and uh, Goa was liberated. Yeah, exactly. Six months later Goa was liberated and March 62 my son was born. And then a few months later, um, Alban was asked to come to Goa as the development commissioner. Uh, there was no secretary to the governor, so he was doing a double job for a little while. Uh, he was not just a Catholic officer, but a, a young man. You know, he didn't want a very senior person who would throw his weight about. And if I hadn't, really and truly, I've talked about this many times, if I hadn't had those three years here, I couldn't have been what I am in terms of the Goan I am today where, as you know, I have a huge group of friends who are from both communities. My social life includes both communities. And that's because of those three years here. Because I was already comfortable with the Hindu community having grown up in Darwar and then gone off to Patna and so forth. But after coming here, 
because I was comfortable with the, the, with the larger Indian community, including in terms of languages and, and religious practices and so forth. And because my husband was in that position, socially I met people from the various strata of Goa, you know. And the desire, not the desire, the urge that I must write and I must write and I feel very flattered when I think about it because I was all of 25 years old then was by, was Prasa, uh, uh, Professor P P Pantrang Pisulenkar, the historian, and Baki Bab. Are you Portuguese zana, you Konkani zana, you English zana, you Shikloli, you Bori Muni Saha, Buroi, Buroi, Buroi. I mean, they really used to be after me. Uh, later too, much later when I was writing about Graham Greene, it is Manwar Sardesai who used to say, why are you wasting your time on green? Anyone can write on green. Am Chikani Buroi. But these are people I met because my husband was posted here. So the posting to Goa was crucial for me. It was excellent for Alban too for various reasons which we can talk about some other time. But for me it really led me into a direction which was just only enriched me. And, and then I began to teach and that I have written about because uh, he was very careful. I mean given what happens now, I mean it's, when I talk about these things people are surprised because um, he didn't allow me to buy liquor, he didn't allow me to do this, he didn't, because the army had left a bad name, we have to be careful, we have this and that. And then they, were, they wanted to start a department of English at Dempe College and there were no people to teach because there was nobody who was qualified because those ones who were qualified were outside Goa. And they had Lucio Rodericks and I used to re revere Lucio Rodericks because he was in Darwad when, when I was in school. But here he was as a congressman teaching at Dempe and they needed one other person. And so then Professor Lavande and one of the trustees came over to ask me to teach. And I said, I have an eight-month-old baby. And they said, well, we'll give you a, a part-time job, but we must, we must have another person. And my husband just put his foot down. He says, no, the education is under, under me. So then you went to Delhi and taught there? Then I went to Delhi, my second child was born and after a few months I went to Lady Shiram College where I taught for 15 years. And then, and then I did UK much later. Okay. So this, this period was from 1963, 66 uh, to 74. Then during the JP agitation we were back in Bihar in Patna. My husband was Commissioner Patna Division and in charge of law and order, he had to keep oh, JP wow. alive, yeah, it was, it was, we, my life has been in some sense lived through historic times, liberation of Goa, the transition, emergency, JP agitation in Patna, in fact one night he took me to, to the area where JP lived to meet him, so, so that was, then we came back to London for two years and then we went to London, uh, not London, came back to Delhi for two years and then we went to London. London was a Commonwealth Secretary. Commonwealth Secretary. She was seconded there to start a division of uh, international cooperation in industry. And he brought the Chogam to Goa. Remember the Chogam yeah, happened yeah, in 85 or something? 83. 83. And then after that, he, uh, we were not quite ready, decided. He, he, he told me before we, were, before we were formally engaged, believe it or not, that when, I, when he retired, he expected me to come and live in Aldona. I and I being a Sashti Khan, I didn't know where Aldona was, I, I didn't see. know what Aldona was. And then he said, that's where I was born and I, there's a family home, it's not in good shape, but we are going to retire there. And so when he finished with the secretariat, there was this question of, do we go to Goa, where do we go? And then he got a job in Chennai and I was very happy in Chennai because I grew up in Darwar and I am comfortable with South Indian culture. So we were there for seven years. While he was there, he was sent here to Goa twice as advisor during the President's rule. I'm sure you know that. 2000, early 2000s? Uh, no, no, no. 1999 and 1991. Okay. By 2000, we were in Aldona. Okay. And I started restoring this house in 97. I see. And we moved to Goa in 2000. But the crucial answer, the most important thing I'm saying to you in this question that you asked me is, but for those three years in Goa, Goa daughter story would not have been written. And your story would have been different. I may not have written it at all. That's the point I'm making. I may not have been writing. I may not have been teaching. And when you were in London, doctor, that was when you came to know uh, Salman Rushdie. 
and you wrote a very early piece on him and uh, all his uh, his books have some goa names in it but that's a totally different story no i, I mind i was from goa uh, when i was in london i did a uh, for a whole year i did a letter from london for the indian express i see and tom morris who was then the editor of the sunday sunday express said uh, to me that you can do what you want just write about what you do so i used to combine literature culture film politics until my husband stopped me because he said you know it was mrs thatcher's time and the irish uh, hunger strikes and yeah. uh, the miners oh, strikes yeah. yeah so i was writing about all that and he said that he was a diplomat so he should i should stop and um, so the green book came i started writing about graham green but yes when you, so the first review to reach india on was Rushdie, was Rushdie. was mine on rusty And you knew him personally very well. But what's his story behind all the Goa names featuring in Midnight's Children? For example, there is a Mario who's also an artist. There's an Aurora. And there's Aurora. Any connection? No, there's no connection. But of course, he knew us, and he he once said in the house. Yeah. We were sitting in, having dinner or something, and my mother was there, and I was known as Maria. I mean, I became. Why did I become Maria? Because when I got married, Alban said that you know I cannot call you Aurora here in Patna. because with my sdo sdo sub divisional officer is an arora and there are so many aroras it's a punjabi sick name so please 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 <laughs> let me call you maria so i am maria after i got married but when i published this book i told penguin whatever you do green is only maria kutu but when this book was signing i signed a contract i said look whatever happens it has to be maria or or kutu because nobody in goa knows me as maria and i don't want it to change and my, and my whole family my intimate friends everybody calls me aurora so it has to get back there so once once rushdi was in the house having dinner or something and he heard my mother calling out to me and he said why does your mother call you aurora and why why does alban call you maria so the story came out you know so 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 that's how it happened that's how it happened doctor you were talking about the synthesis within goan within goan society within indian society and i know you also feel upset that you know there is a chasm there is a gap between these two major communities uh in goa the hindus and the catholics and or vice versa what's your views on that i don't know whether there's a chasm i've never thought it was a chasm in fact i should like to think that that there is no chasm from the time i was living here which was in 62 65 you know I never felt that there's a chasm. Uh, I like the definition that uh, Suresh Amonkar gave me, and which I have quoted many times. He said, "We live parallel lives. We live parallel lives in total peace and harmony, but the parallel lives never crossed. Now, crossing can be not a good thing. Also, it can be uh, crossing is not the same as joining." in my view and i'm just articulating this thought when you ask me this question i've never thought about it before but the question of cross is not the same as join yeah so what he meant i think was that there was never a, 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 a conflict between the two communities they were parallel they they did not meet they did not cross they didn't meet either and but, but i think that has changed right and i have always been proud of the fact that the community has lived lived peacefully until politics of culture has invaded goa as it has the rest of the country and then the inevitable obviously happens you know seeds are planted into minds on both minds and um, so that's my answer to you so what's the recommendation what is the way out how do we bridge you know misunderstanding oh my goodness potential, that's potential uh, it's it's uh, it would be very presumptuous on my part <laughs> to give advice on this it is an individual uh, thing and also i suppose led by the leaders of the communities the leaders of the church and opening to other religions not to think of other religions as other you know that we are all goan we are all human so if we follow our own religion and and not you know be divisive in i mean the divisions will always be created even in personal relationship even among friends right. but it's up to us to understand and go beyond that and see what uh, what connects us and i think that if i am what i am it's because i have lived inside a community where this sort of conflict didn't exist and goa 
didn't have a conflict, but there was a separation installed by the Inquisition. And uh, you asked me in your questionnaire about the Inquisition. And I think that, I mean, my book is, as I said, my book is very unpopular. There have been people and friends and even a priest who's told me quite clearly we didn't like your book at all. So the point is that... When Why is it? Because it's a bit too blunt, a bit too honest. It touches on the raw nerve. No. You see, when I was asked to write this book by Penguin, yeah. I said, don't expect a touristy kind of book. I want to understand Goa for myself. I want to understand our culture. I want to understand who we are. And believe it or not, in the first chapter I wrote, the first thing I wrote before going to Portugal to research was uh, on the conversion process. The, I was completely, utterly shocked when I read the dictates of the Inquisition. I couldn't sleep. I was so completely shocked. I went to London. I went to London on the way and um, to Portugal and left my draft. It was only on the conversion, on the process. It, that chapter became three chapters afterwards. I left it with Girish Karnat, who was then posted in London, and he's an old friend. And I said, I'll pick it up on my way back. And he said, this is the first honest uh, discussion of the process, that, and don't change a word. So, but the point to get back to the whole thing is that I wanted to understand who we are, why we are so close and yet so apart, you know? And uh, I think that the book helped me to understand. And, and that's why the chapter on synthesis. So I, I think that if we are now drawing apart, part of it is because we are insecure. Part of it is inflicted by leaders in our community, politicians, some parts of the church. Um, and I think that that is something that is to be regretted. The, the, the Catholics tend to believe that we have a unique identity. No, I'll do tell you, you what. Overplayed? Do you think this view is overplayed or it's a bit exaggerated or it's unhelpful, probably? Uh, uh, I don't know whether they, I don't know what people think about the, the our unique identity, but they of course don't mingle easily. And uh, I, I will answer that question by giving you another point of view, which is that I feel that Goans, Goans not Goan Catholics, have a unique personality. And I've discussed this with friends in uh, Delhi and elsewhere, and including with friends here. And I think that personality cuts across both religions, and that's because of Portuguese law. I think Portuguese law gave us a sense of self, I mean, uh, a very strong sense of self, a strong, very sense, uh, strong sense of the individual self, me. You can't dictate to me. And I always like to quote uh, Manuel. Manwar Bhav, who used to say, Aung Sangtan Tu Aik. That's the attitude of the Goan, Aung Sangtan Tu Aik. So, 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 so we have a very strong sense of self, we have, because I think that, you know, the laws of the 18th century that came to us gave us a sense of individual self, it gave us the vote later, the Catholics first, the kind of thing that didn't happen in the rest of India. Uh, and then the Uniform Civil Code. Uh, I have talked to so many of my Hindu friends, and young women, older women, and they say, of course, we are different. I mean, we are more confident, and even young people. I mean, I've been talking to um, young women who are um, like in their late 20s, who have studied outside Goa, and they say there's a big difference between how we are and how we are treated in our homes and the freedoms we have, and people of our own class across the border, they do not have and how they come here on holiday and find they're free and that's what happens here. They come here to let go of the inhib inhibitions. I'm not talking about the people I know, but I'm talking about, you know, the tourist culture and things like that. I, yeah. I think the most important thing in my perspective, which I hope uh, you can agree with, is that it is our bounden duty to approach the other and not to withdraw. I, that's what I feel. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches us. So if we withdraw saying we are different, I mean, I've had those experiences in Goa, and comments about me, even when I arrived in this village, wearing a sari, wearing a, a plait, wearing a bindi, wearing a mangal sutra, Badur used to be asked, ki tu, tu ji bhai, Krishna so, so, this is not to be, this is not to be broadcast, but this, you can ask Badur to the questions he's been asked. And I like Diaz for Diwali. 
because we always, my children just loved writing diyas for Diwali wherever we were posted. But we have huge cribs as well. And there are some of our, the children of our Hindu friends who have cribs also. So I think we, we have to in, encourage these inter-religious cultural uh, customs. I mean, a crib is both religious but also cultural, you know. So I think that... Um, but at the same time, Doctor, we've had uh, religious intolerance in the past. You know, Goa has been a meeting point, a clashing point of cultures. So how... Do what do you mean by past? How far past? Uh, I mean, across history in Goa, while we tend to look at the positive side of history, there has been a lot of religious intolerance, you know, during the Portuguese time. Subsequently. Yeah, during the Portuguese times, that was absolutely... So how do we overcome that? How, how do we overcome the, the... Look, this is 450 years, 500 years ago. If we can't uh, overcome that by education and you know, inculturation, understanding history, understanding where we are born, if you don't understand that, if you feel you are half Portuguese or full Portuguese or full whatever, Western, then that's a disaster for, for the self as well as for the state, I think. But in your writing, in your writing, you have made the point that, uh, you know, elections in Goa, limited elections in the 19th century, caused this problem of bringing up caste conflict, for example. Yeah. And today, adult franchise also brings up these issues of conflict. I yeah. mean, that's yeah. the nature of politics. Yeah. So then, you know, at every election, these things seem to get aggravated. In between, it seems to be fine. It seems to be okay. It seems to be working. But at election time, you know, these wounds keep getting raked up. So, so how do we deal with that? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's impossible to deal with that with, at the point at which we are, honestly. We have reached a sort of dead end where the conflict is huge the, and the corruption is huge. Our entire electorate is corrupted. Literally, the electorate is corrupted. The amount of money that passes hands, I'm not saying that every voter is corrupt, but I'm just saying that the electorate, the majority is corrupted. Money is, flows before the elections, for every election, even the Zilla Parishad election recently. And that is happening all over the country. It's just, I don't think how Goa, I do not know. You remember Goa used to be celebrated as the place for communal harmony. I also think that it's very much, very important for the, the role of the church, not to create a separateness, not to say that, you know, our religion is better or we are different. And, they're very there, and you know there are sermons that happen like that, and it upsets me. Uh, I think that um, I've lived in Tamil Nadu, I've travelled in Kerala. I'm not sure whether the same kind of divisions uh, exist. There's a kind of separateness in the sense that there's a different kind of culture. We use this kind of chili for the curry whereas they use this kind of things for the curry. I mean, that sort of thing goes on, but I don't think it is a kind of superiority, inferiority that sometimes happens here, you know. We, we know better, we speak Portuguese, we have interacted with the West. Um, I think these are, there is a sense of super. In fact, I was talking to a friend of mine two days ago because you were going to come about the sense of superiority among the Catholics, and they are a mixed marriage couple who have married, uh, the inter-religious marriage, and they both jumped at me and they said, don't worry. The Hindu guy said, we also feel superior to you, so don't think you only feel superior to us. <laughs> so it is, it is obviously something that is very much entrenched because of difference. But ultimately, it's the person that has to overcome it. And the leaders of the church or the leaders of the community, including the leaders in politics, have to bridge, help the population to bridge the gap. But it will never happen in politics. It cannot happen. It won't happen. Doctor, you said sociology is not your field, but literature very much is. And uh, your books have uh, been you know, widely appreciated and noticed nationally and internationally. Uh, you know, and of course the awards that have come in and things like that. Despite, in spite of the criticism locally, that's, that's a different issue altogether. But talking about your books, can you give us a brief gist about Graham Greene, about uh, uh, you know, daughter story about Philomena's journey about uh, Brigandza Pereira and... Uh, Which Pereira? Uh, sorry, your, your ethnography, Ali. Ah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, everything that's happened to me has been a matter of, I think, divine intervention, you know, very divine blessings. I mean, I, I, most people, my mother used to say to me in Portuguese, you know, say, 
fair or horror thing. Which means I don't know what kind of faith you have because <laughs> it was certainly not her kind of faith. But I am the, I have deep, deep faith, as I keep I was saying to Anderson, you know. The daughter's story, uh, we came back to India. For, uh, I did my PhD before going to London. Uh, and then on I... On Denry? Yes, it was, uh, it, you know, it, was a, a comp it was a theme of religious humanism in the novels of uh, Francois Mauriac because I had done French in college and Graham Greene. But uh, to get back to the book, we went to, when I was in London, I was all the time participating in, you know, BBC programs and seminars in universities, but I didn't have a job. I did this letter from, from London and I did the Graham Greene. So my husband was very particular that I keep in the discipline of uh, English education and not going to journalism or anything else. But I was always politicized for some reason, God alone knows why. When we came to Patna, to Madras, there was a, there used to be a very famous conference in Delhi held every two years. It was an international conference called on the Indira Gandhi International Conference. It went on for two days, and each day had eight sessions. And uh, someone who knew me in London, who was then in the Prime Minister's Secretary, sent me a, a note saying, "We want you to." present a paper and I was terrified because uh, I hadn't done something like that for a long time, international conference, big names coming. And uh, so my husband said, one thing about my husband was that he never, he always wanted me to keep my mind alive as he used to say. Uh, so he said, look, you always grumble that you, you lost your job by going to London and so now for heaven's sake do this. And so I chose the subject culture shock, culture wars, the search for identity. Because that time, what was very alive was the breakup of Yugoslavia and all, all, the, all that went with that, and then Palestine, Israel, you know, it, it, and it was an international conference. And I was told that you have to write in terms of India, but also the international conference. So I said no, then I said yes, and then I sent, wrote a paper, short paper, uh, because it was going to be a paper which was going to be discussed and sent it to Delhi. I, to get back to faith, I very often think that my mother is responsible for my writing, honestly. Uh, so then uh, this paper went to Delhi and uh, some days later I got a call from Delhi saying, the boss says that you will, be the, you will have to be the first presenter at your session because, uh, so I got tell, but you have to write something more. So I said, I'm scared. Uh, to do the first paper. These are people coming. I mean, there was the, uh, some legislator from Israel and somebody else from Poland and or, you know, and I said, I can't do the first paper. They said, no, you have to because their flights may not be in time. So I said, tell your boss that my, my really my mother was dying. Okay. And I said, my mother is very seriously ill and if something happens, I will not be able to come. So I got a reply saying, if that happens, they'll make some arrangement that you have to do the first paper and you have to write something more. So I, my son had presented me with a laptop. Right. And so this was in 1998, I think, yeah. So I kept the laptop on, literally on my lap. And I said, what shall I write? What can I write? And then I thought that the person who really made the cultural connection, the person who had to move from one culture to other and adjust and live was my mother. And just before that, the Stains murders had taken place and I had writ written a piece for the Hindu on Indian Christianity in which I had also put Goan Christianity. So here I wrote about my mother. I just wrote six paragraphs about my mother and I waited for Alban to come back from his walk and put the laptop on his lap and I said, read it. And he said, um, don't change a word. And I said, how do I fit it into what I've said? He said, you are a teacher, you know how to move it around. Then I went to Delhi and uh, this, is a this is like a story. That's why I say I have faith, I think it's my mother. Uh, so then I went to Delhi and uh, I showed it to a friend with whom I was staying, who was also part of the organizers. And he said, Maria, this is so, so strong, don't change it somehow fit it in, you make that the centerpiece and do the rest. At, at lunch, two very great, well-known writers whom I'd never met before, Gurcharan Das and Sunil Kildani came up to me and said, when is your book coming out? So I said, what book? 
And they said, your paper is the germ of a book. So I said, I just laughed and went home. And three months later, Penguin sent Ravi Singh to my house uh, to ask for a book. So I said, book on what? And he, he, he said, he didn't know what to say. He just said, tell her to give us a book. And he said, but I have to read something that she wrote before. So at least I know what she writes. So he said, oh, she used to write letters from London some years ago, read those newspapers. And then my husband came in at that time and all along he didn't want me to touch Goa because, because of my father's history, he felt it were a painful experience. And that's when he said, Maria, I think this is your Goa book. I can't stop you. So that's how it happened. And it's, I don't think this should be broadcast, but this is really how it happened. I mean, I, I, if I tell people Penguin asked me for a book, a woman who had never written a book, they'll, they'll think I'm making up a story or bragging. But, but both, it, both your books actually, Doctor, weave in the personal together with a whole lot of background. Yes, I, I, I've been told that that is something that is very... They, my editors like it a lot. Yeah. They, they say it makes that it you, readable, it makes it readable, but it also puts the issue in context. Yeah, but don't you think this is extraordinary how my book came about? Yeah. It was yeah. just, um, so I always say it's my mother. I wrote about her and I got to write a book. But at that stage, probably the rest of India still needed a local voice to explain uh, Goa, Goa from a local perspective, no? because there was a shortage of books. I don't think they were wanting to, I don't think they wanted a local voice for Goa. I think they wanted, uh, you know, it was a time, it was really the time when this whole business of conversion, Christianity came okay. about. Okay. And so they wanted a local voice about Goa, but basically Explaining. it was to be a Christian voice. Explaining. Explaining, yeah. And so I started with the conversion. And then I came to Goa. I, used to, I was restoring the house, so I used yeah. to come every three months and stay for A lot two. of research. A lot of research. But what helped me was the connections I'd made when in 62. So all the Hindu houses, families I approached, oh, yeah. I They're knew. There. They all helped me. You know, they took me here, they took me there, took me to the temples and the Catholics did it. Uh, I was part of their community anyway. Yeah. But the opening of the, uh, the understanding of the other community. But it touches on a lot of hot and controversial issues in that sense, which is probably why people feel a little bit, uh, you know, wary about <coughs> how much we want to put our lives out there, let's say. What so, which controversy? I thought the biggest controversy was that I wrote about the Inquisition in detail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, you've asked me a question about what you think about the Inquisition. Yeah. And I think that the Catholic doesn't want to see it, uh, which I, is, I can quite understand, because I was also completely shocked uh, up with the details, because I, you read about the Inquisition, you read about hangings and burnings, but you don't really know about these cultural laws which prevented us from from looking different, from eating different, I mean, made us eat, eat, look different, eat different, talk different, mm -hmm. uh, change our identities. So that is what I wanted to understand. And many of my friends, young friends, young Hindu friends, have said that we began to understand why this is happening, why we go to Milagros Church, why this, because after reading that chapter. And, uh, and my husband teased me because I called the chapter in which I talk about the community that didn't convert, I call it keeping the faith. And uh, so he said, you'll be thrown out of the church, you're calling it. And then he was he teased me because I, we contributed to Vidya Jyoti, you know, the journal yeah, from Delhi. Yeah. And they gave me a very good review. I see. So he said, the Jesuits have forgiven you. <laughs> so, so, but here I've been told to my face also by one or two priests that we didn't like your book. Partly, I mean, like we, there are some issues which we feel we shouldn't be touching, maybe, maybe. But your other book also touches on a lot of uh, tough issues in the sense that these are more personal, dealing with your family, dealing with the Margai. You know, the point is, I would never have written that book if my editor hadn't pushed me when I was still writing the first book. Yeah. I had not completed it. He wrote to me saying, I've got the subject of your next book. I Actually, I think my good fortune was that there were no books coming out of Goa, on Goa for general readership. Yeah. And I made it quite clear to or David. serious books at least, all touristy books. No, like exactly. And I made it clear to David Devida that this is not going to be a touristic book and that it's not, it will be researched as in, from a scholarly point of view, but it's going to be written for 
for the general public. Uh, so he wrote to me, the editor, saying, I've got the subject of your next book. And I said, no way. And that was? That was, he said, the story of your parents. I see. So I said, I can't write it. I just, it's I out of the question. And I didn't. And then uh, Donna, I, the, you know, the daughter of uh, Braganza Pereira, who was married, married to Menes Braganza, she and her brother, all, both in their 80s, he actually physically came here to ask me to translate the book. I see. So I, ethnography, ethnography. Yes. So I said, I, because first he was writing to me from Portugal, her brother. I see. That is the, the son of the, of the person who wrote the book. But uh, my editor wouldn't leave me. He just wouldn't leave me. He said, you have to do that book because, not because it's your parents' story, but because you will give us a larger Catholic culture, okay. you know. And he's the one who pushed me into researching about Portuguese education, primary school education, and so forth. So, so it's, it's not... And, and I think for me, because of the personal story, it was a, a catharsis. I, I guess that you think translations, you feel that translations are important in that sense, ethnography or not. If you had a chance, if I'm right, and if you had a chance, what other books would you like to translate or would you feel other people should translate? I, I'm just too old to go through all that effort before. No, just maybe, maybe someone else can run with the pattern. Uh, there are so many things that have come out, you know, that, uh, I mean, I can't tell you off, offhand, but I will certainly write to you. But I think some of the good fiction, some of the good history, historical analysis of uh, Portuguese Goa, uh, some of the book that's, uh, books that are being published in Portugal about Goa, which, are, which look at empire in a different way. Um, uh, this girl, um, Barret Xavier, Angela's yeah. books. And there are so many books that can be translated for, for also somehow simplified for general readership, because many of these books which I value are in very academic language. And my books are not at all academic, and the language certainly is not. So I think what has to be translated, I feel, is for general readership. Yeah. You don't agree? Yeah, uh, but Doctor, I want you to tell us the story of Archive, Pundalik Naik's Archive, because I believe that you had a hand in it, finally getting translated after so many years, maybe quarter century after it was first published. Am I right or am I wrong? No, no, no. I, I wasn't... Uh, I know I, you like to play it down, but it was your student who... No, no, not my student. I, I got to know him when I should, was restoring this book. And I knew Mini Krishnan very well yeah. in London. Mini Krishnan was not your student? No, no, no. 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 Mini Krishnan is a Tamil girl. Yeah. I was teaching in Delhi. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, the, um, Chennai is a highly literary place. And uh, everybody reads, everybody buys books, there are book clubs. So, uh, so Minnie became a friend and she became, suddenly was in charge of translation at the, when she moved from Macmillan to Oxford University Press. Yeah. And so we started talking about Konkani and Archev was very popular at the time and I met him just once and she said, okay, I'll do it. But the, the story about Archev is not that I knew Minnie Krishnan but that I um, stepped in to make, to, to, to stepped in at a funny time. So, so it was translated by this lady who was very good, I keep forgetting her name. The person who tried, yeah, she's a Konkani from yeah. Anglo, but, yeah. and it was a good translation, but uh, she said, Maria, I want you to read it. And I said, what's the point of my reading it when I can't read the Devanagri? I can't read Devanagri. With their pie, with their pie. With their pie. I said, I'm sure she's done a good job. I can read the translation. That's no problem. Uh, and uh, but I can't read the original, so I can't yeah. help you. She said, Okay, at least read the translation and see what happens. And see what you feel. And I found two sentences there. One was, uh, he came home tired or something, and he poured feni or something like that uh, into a cup and drank it. And I thought funny drinking fanny from a cup. And then he went fishing and he, wore sh he changed into short pants and went fishing. Somehow, I don't remember the exact sentences, yeah. but it was short pants and cup. And somehow it grated. And I had, I have a habit of making friends easily, so I had made friends with, uh, with uh, Pundi. 
I had his phone number, so I rang him from Chennai and I said, Pulik, you keep Buruel Ole. He says, Are you by, by Maria, by, I'm Buruel Ole. I'm Kop Pan, so then Kop Pan. So that became Kap. And he cast the Galun. So how do you translate cast? Yeah. These are all the geographical divides which yeah, we Yeah, so then uh, how do we do? Then she couldn't do the Dalo at all. I see. It was beyond her. Translating the Dalo. Dalo. So she found it difficult, so she, it had been left out. So I arranged a meeting here when I, I used to come periodically to restore the house. So Pundi came and... Here? Uh, here to the south, but it was not ready, yeah. yeah. Pundi came and Tali, what Tali is he? who works in all India radio. Yeah, Mukesh, yeah, Mukesh, Mukesh, Mukesh Tali. Because Mukesh was the bridge between Konkani and English. Yeah. So we sat here and uh, he did a lot of the, added the dalos and whatever had to be added. But the story is, yes, I knew Mini Krishna and I pushed her. But for me, the story is the cop and the kafti. <laughs> and the last question before we tie up. Because what I felt that the translator has to know the culture. Yeah. You have to know the culture. You may not yeah. know, you know. You and sometimes to... it's just geographical, no, doctor, because uh, Vidya Pai is from a Mangalorean background. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Know, his concepts yeah. may not be equally valid. There, yeah. So she, she does a great job in translating. No, no, she's very good. Yeah. She's done a lot. Done a she's lot done a lot. Yeah. yeah. In fact, she's done the most for Goan Konkani writing, except for Ma, um, Bai Mauzo's translator. Yeah. Yeah. He's also That's, done. Uh, yeah, Kota's done excellent yeah. work. And of course, my friend Mini Agusto Pinto also is. Uh, he doesn't write do much, no Agush. Yeah, he he is very capable, but I wish. I know. I don't know why because he's a very good translator yeah. and a good writer, but he doesn't. I, he seems to have vanished from the yeah. scene. If I say something, it may trigger off another fight between me and him. But we leave it at that. One last question before we tie you out completely: your own translation in, into Portuguese. Which your point? book? I would, I don't understand. Your, your book, uh, I think Daughter's Story, no? Came out with a Portuguese version. Yes, yes. Uh, well, my Portuguese is not good enough to... To do it yourself, yeah. No, it's been done. Yeah, it's been done. It's been done. Done by a Portuguese guy. My Portuguese is certainly not good enough. I was yeah. not educated in Portuguese. I speak yeah. it and I don't even speak it well. But friends of mine who, not in Goa, but Goan friends in Portugal who've read it have said, Puti said me, God, it could have been better. It's not so well. I changed translators, by the way. The first translator didn't know Goan culture at all. So I was getting a lot of things wrong. So I told Fyunta Saurian, this won't work. I, okay. I will not accept it. Within I two see. chapters, I gave it up. I see. Then this, uh, the Vashku who translated it knew Goa well because he'd done a documentary on Goa and he loves Goa. So then he said, okay, I'll do, then he said, I'll do two chapters and show you how it can read. I see. And it was much better. So then he did it. But uh, no, I couldn't possibly have. I couldn't possibly have translated it myself. You you are setting the tone for us and making translations important. I think in a multilingual society like Goa, probably you need more of translations. I mean, India needs translations. Yeah. You know, we are a multi multilingual, not a state but a country. And I think, for instance, Bai's books have reached all over all yeah. the states because of the translations and. Basically, a lot has happened because of the translation to, into English. Yeah. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but that's what is the situation now. But my book has also been translated into Devanagari Konkani by Hema Naik. I see. And it was published by the Konkani Academy. Right. So, so, yes, as I said, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think you will agree with me that what has happened to me, what I've done has uh, been a matter of... Uh, a lot of good fortune, my parents, my mother in particular, but also a very deep faith, you know. I mean, I'm in a, such a mess in the last five years, mobility. I was such an active person, I can't go out. I can't climb steps. We've made another, another, another gate so that at least I can walk out to the car and go to the hospital. So, but I think what keeps me going is, yeah, as I said, the life of the mind, you know. So... Doctor, whether I agree or not is not important, though, though I don't disagree at all with what you're saying. But I think, uh, you know, we, we are really grateful that you spent so much time to put this on record because it's an important part of our history, of our understanding of the past, you know, and maybe of seeing your books in context and your life in context. I'm so grateful for the time you spent here. Thank you so much. And oh, that's, I, that's sweet. I've enjoyed talking to you and I enjoy, um, yeah, I, I enjoy talking. 
very much. I'm I a teacher. It's important to record this. It's important to record this because tomorrow no. we, 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 we find there's nothing existing. But, but the point that I'd like to make finally is really that there is a basic unity between the Catholic one, Hindu and Catholic, which is beyond religion. It is to do with the culture and the law. I just feel very strongly about how the law that changed the 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 many things in Goa, including the vote, and uh, most importantly, the uniform civil code, gave gave a sense of strong identity to the woman, gave a strong a sense of strong identity to the man. You know, one of the first things. Um, Dhanita Singh, you must have heard of her, she, a renowned photographer said to me that, you know, Maria, what I've noticed after coming to us, she has, she has a place in your village, yeah, Saligaon. Yeah, she said, you know, the women here never look down, they look, look you in the eye. So that confidence comes not from birth. It comes from birth, of course, but it comes through a knowledge of, of who this woman is. Of course, there are people, there are families in which the women are uh, dominated and put down. I'm not saying that women here but they are much stronger than elsewhere. I, my mother was, my mother was a Goan Catholic woman. She, look at the way she raised, look, look at the struggle she went through. She had deep faith, very, very deep faith. It's a uh, fascinating and insightful story, of course, that's, that's another interview altogether. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating, so, I mean, like. And my father too had very strong, very deep faith. Which also talks about a migration story in that story. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, there is a paper written by some professor of history in Delhi, which was presented at an international conference. Somebody rang up and told me, in which they talk about my mother in relation to migration. I see. Which I would never thought, I would never thought of migration from Goa to Darwar as migration. But it is migration. It's a different world, yeah. Although it it's is, so close, it was so close. Yeah, so... And all the intricacies that come out in your book, you say that all the Goans, they were from Bardes and not from Salset, which is so true in that sense. Uh, there was a question which my granddaughter disapproved of my answer, didn't disapprove, finally I explained it to her with reference to the sense of identity and I said I think it's stronger in Salsit than in Pardes uh, because… Even on the Jesuits? I said it's because of the <laughs> Jesuits, I said it may be because of the Jesuits but what I meant is there's a very strong of sense of uh, devo devotion to the land so it, I feel it's grounded in land uh, all the old uh, Catholic customs remo remain, you know, uh, which are really folk traditions of rose and stuff like that, which is, which is not Catholic, it is folk. Probably pre-Hindu also. Exactly, folk. When folk is pre-Hindu or pre-whatever, you know, but it's folk, it's uh, uh, primordial uh, existence. And also um, land and also I think um, uh, basically it is land and also all the cultural forms, whether it's the theater or the mando, everything is in Konkani and a lot of it, if, if not most of it, it comes from Salsit. So sh my granddaughter who has links with Bardia said, why Nani, why not Bardias? And I said, I don't know, probably Jesuits versus Franciscans were more easy going. But I said there's much less Konkani and more Marathi and English speak also spoken that, that in English Sardis. Also, education coming here, this side earlier. And yeah, yeah. I earlier. was telling her the first schools oh, came yeah. here. Aldona was one of the first yeah, schools, yeah. the Swara school. But she objected to that and said, I, I had to explain to her why this is so, because I myself am trying to understand. There are so many issues with, with all, all the work and so many questions open up that I think we'll never have enough time to, to well, wrap it and conclusively understand. But thank you so much for... Pleasure, pleasure was so mine. I hope it's made some sense. A lot, a lot. Thank you.